Hey there, Brittany here. Before we dive into today's episode, I wanted to let you know about a special online mini training that I'm offering for free for a limited time. It's called Peace, Love, Stepmom. And not to toot my own horn, but beep beep, it's pretty freaking awesome. Peace Love Stepmom will give you the exact steps to take in order to create more harmony in your step family without feeling like you have to walk on eggshells or bite your tongue or ignore your own needs just to keep the peace. Because if you are listening to this, then chances are pretty good that you know there's a big difference between not fighting and actually feeling peaceful. To enroll in Peace Love Stepmom and get immediate access to this incredible online course, head to peacelovestepmom.com and sign up. It's totally free. You don't want to miss it. So go to peacelovestepmom.com to enroll and get immediate access. Now on with the show. Where would you take your life if you knew you could not fail. I get it. As a stepmom, mom, and entrepreneur, sometimes it can feel like what everyone else expects of you versus what you dream about for yourself are on opposite ends of the spectrum. As a woman, you're taught from a very young age what society thinks you're worth based on how you look, how you behave, and how much money you're allowed to bring in. But I'm here to show you that you can be the woman who has it all, and not just on the outside. I'm Brittany Lynch, and you are the queen of your castle. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the Queen of Your Castle podcast. I am your host, Brittany Lynch, coming at you with a very, 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 very special guest here today. Um, I want to introduce you to a beautiful soul called Amanda and Amanda is here to nourish you and hold you and reach into your soul and give you some love in a place that maybe you didn't even know that you needed it. So Amanda, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. I know that my audience listeners, were, they're just going to love you and eat you up. And, and I'm so honored to be holding this space here with you, for you at home, in your car, walking your dog, whatever you're doing, tuning in to listen to us have a chat tonight. So Amanda, why don't you let our listeners know who are you where are you from what do you love what makes you tick what are you all about so good I think that was maybe the best intro to a podcast (laughs) and introduction that I've had so thank you for that Um, I'm really excited to be here and gosh I love that you didn't just ask what do you do you asked so much more than that what makes you tick what are you into right now Um, So really quickly, I guess, you know, I'm a life coach and I work with people on inner child healing. And I think that's how I'll probably reach into your soul today because it affects everyone in such a deep way to connect with their inner child. And specifically, I love working with entrepreneurial women and visionary women and helping them kind of reach back and unearth all the childhood trauma they have so they can really step into their purpose and their mission And yeah, I do that through the inner child healing and through breath work. So both of those things really help you, yeah, dive in and go deep, which is, I think the easiest way to describe myself. I love going deep. And currently I am in Colorado with my pug Buddha. She's my life. (laughs) Um, I've kind of been all over the place. I definitely am a Sagittarius gal. I love traveling. (sighs) I love adventure and yeah, I love all things mystical. So that's a little bit about me. Amazing. My son, Rory, he just turned three. He's a Sagittarius and I love, I love the Sag. So here we are. Yes. Uh, So when you say for, you know, inner child work is something that once you know about it, you know about it, but before you know about it, you're like, what are you talking about? Um, you know, the first time that I, that I myself experienced inner child work was with my therapist. 
right? And and it came in the form of, you know, I, I had, when I grew up, I was super poor. We never had birthdays. Holidays were always a really stressful time. My dad was an alcoholic and a drug addict. And, and so birthdays were this big inconvenience, right, for my single mom. And so my therapist, my amazing therapist, Claire, if you're listening, I love you. Uh, My amazing therapist introduced me to this concept of inner child work. And we were talking about birthdays. I I had this pattern of crashing and burning holidays, right? I'd sabotage holidays all the time. And so what she had me do was hold a birthday party for myself as if I was a little girl have that birthday party that I never got to have when I was a girl so my husband god bless his soul Seamus threw me my 30th birthday was princess jasmine themed with unicorns and purple everything and we went go-karting and we had a big cake and it was so healing and it was like it was super emotional it was a super intense thing to kind of power through But up until that point in time, I never would have been able to put those pieces together. And so, you know, my kind of anecdotal experience of how powerful and transformative and intense and deep, like you said, inner child work can get for someone who's never heard of inner child work. How would you explain it to me like I'm a third grader? Like, what is inner child work as if I'm in the third grade? Mm -hmm. I love that question. I also want to touch on how much vulnerability was in what you just shared. And I absolutely loved your share. So um, that's a good question. So when I explain inner child work to people, you're so right. It's so confusing until you actually do it. (laughs) But it's really just you know, connecting with the little version of you. And you gave such a solid example there with like this wounding around holidays and birthdays and how you could go back and do a healing that's able to reach back to your little girl at that time who had experienced trauma and actually give them what they needed during that time. And I think that's the simplest way to describe it. It's reaching back in time and giving that little version of you that was wounded what they needed. And when you do that, you're stepping into this new adult self that they didn't have at the time, or maybe they did, but that person was wounded and you are reparenting them. And I think just having that concept of like, that's what you're doing. You're stepping into your adult self, you're reparenting and you're giving yourself love and compassion or a birthday party um, so that you can heal because that little version of you is like, before you had that birthday party, you know, that little version of you was walking around sabotaging the holidays and carrying around that, I'm assuming like deep grief and maybe some anger. And you were able to be like, "Mm, no, I'm going to do this a little differently now. So that's how I would describe it to someone who doesn't know what it is. Mm, So beautiful and such important work. So I want to ask you a question specifically, Uh, you know, this way you touched on how I would walk around as an adult sabotaging holidays, right, as as this result of this wounding. And a lot of the clients and women that I have the fortune of meeting in this line of work, um, to me, what I see is, you know, as a stepmom, you kind of occupy this space with a child who doesn't belong to you. You're really sensitive of all of their kind of quirks and weirdnesses of these kids. And it's hard to bond. And from what I see, my perspective is that a lot of this difficulty bonding comes in fact from an inner child wound. Um, my question for you is what are some ways for someone again, who's never heard of inner child work and is just starting to get to know it. What are some kind of ways that you'd be able to identify this person does have some inner child wounding that needs some nurturing and some healing and, and some grief kind of love to, to mend that over. That's such a good question. Um, I think that some of the main things that I see, the first one that I'll touch on is codependency. And I think that's the biggest one because when you don't have that solid sense of self that's created in childhood, especially if you were like helping mom, helping dad, 
they had emotional issues, alcoholism. They were even like emotionally immature, which I see a lot with people who have a wounded inner child. You didn't really figure out how to take care of yourself. And from a young age, you realize that in order to stay safe and in order to receive love, you had to like look outside of yourself and be codependent on others to receive um, or to help others in order to be seen as valid. So codependency is a big one, you know, getting in toxic relationships or attracting people who are very similar to your mom or your dad. And I think you can tell if you have an unhealed inner child as well, just because you don't know how to self-soothe. You don't know how to take care of yourself in hard moments. And you can find yourself getting really triggered by things and realizing you're having like an overreaction almost. And, you know, to your inner child, it's not an overreaction. It's very real. But to the outside, that can just look like being really jealous by something that maybe <laughs> someone who's healthy wouldn't be jealous of or things like that. So those are a few different characteristics of how you would know. Mm -hmm. So good. Um, I, I'm having this thought popping into my head and I've heard this, you know, with clients who are in the stepmom story or other clients I've worked with that in some other way, some other capacity at some point. And they'll, what we do is we take a look at, you know, kind of how did you grow up? What kind of conditioning did you go through? You know, what did you learn was good, bad, right, wrong, da, 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 da. Um, and then a lot of the time I'll have clients who will kind of pause in that space and they'll say, I don't know where this is coming from because I had a really good childhood, right? My parents were really good to me, right? Um, and as their coach, as your coach, we can see these patterns. It's not our job to tell you about them though, right? It's our job to help you find those. Mm -hmm. So do you... Do you run into that also with your clients where they're like, I had a good childhood, but they're still wounding that needs to be healed. Is that, is that, is that a defense mechanism? Is that denial? Or can you be wounded even when you have a good childhood? Oh my gosh, this is such a good question. So I'll probably answer it in multiple ways because there's so much to dig into here and so much nuance here. But the first thing I'll say is just usually when I hear that, especially when they're really certain, the people who are really certain they had a good childhood, I'm like, bullshit, immediately. <laughs> like, bullshit radar off the charts. Like there's absolutely no way because everyone has wounding and that's the nuance here. Like, yes, everyone has wounding. So I always know that something is up when someone says I had a really happy childhood and there's nothing to work through because there's always something to work through. And to me, that just means in a loving way, of course, like you're unaware of what there is underneath the surface. And it takes a lot of compassion and a lot of grace to kind of peel away the levels of denial the layers of denial that are on top of that story. And I would say most commonly, if we want to get to the core of it, when someone says that it usually means that their physical needs were met, but their emotional needs were not met. 100%. And that's what they're holding on to is like, I hear it all the time. I had a roof over my head. I always had food. Uh, we went on vacations together and I'm like, okay, but was there intimacy? Was there connection? And then they're like, oh, <laughs> maybe I didn't have the best childhood, but they, you know, they still have excuses, of course, and layers on top of that. But I would say anyone who's operating under that story to just take a deeper look and really ask yourself, like, is that the full truth? For anyone who has, you know, like very obvious inner child wounding, you know, somebody like me who had a very like obvious, you're obviously your inner child's really fucked up, Brittany. Like there's no, there's no skirting around that one <laughs> versus somebody who says I had a really good childhood. Um, what are the commonalities that you would see when you start to peel that onion when you get that kind of first glimpse into what steps you need to take to give that little person inside of you some love 
So I think that the answer to the question you're asking is more about like the specific layers of wounding that you have. And some people are operating under more denial. Some people are operating under like, wow, I've experienced a lot of trauma. And I think you can have both. Like I had both where I knew I, I was under denial about certain parts of the trauma, but there was a deep part of me that also knew that something was wrong. And I'll say that the commonality is that when people come in to do inner child healing, um, there is like a really deep part of you that is drawn to the work because in your soul, your higher self, whatever you want to call it, you know that something wasn't right. And so no matter if people present with like, oh my gosh, my childhood was awful and I really need to heal this, this stuff and work on my inner child or everything was great. I find that after a few sessions, like we usually arrive at the same point, which is that there is stuff to work on mm -hmm. and there was hurt and they were drawn to this work, whether it's inner child work or coaching because they need help unearthing the stuff that they aren't aware is there or they don't know how to work through on their own. Mm, so good. Um, and on that note, and I want to kind of go back to something that you had said earlier, when you said, you know, there's always, there's always something to work through, right? Like there's always, there's always work to do. And I think it's really important that, um, that we kind of normalize this conversation around the fact that it's okay to heal, like whether or not you had a super stable childhood, it's okay to go back there and say, okay, what can I do for myself differently, right? Now that I'm an adult, now that I can make these choices, now that I can love myself, right? Now that I know what my needs are, now that I know I'm, a, a, I'm allowed and worthy of having those needs met, I think it's good to normalize that conversation for people who are like, I did have a really good childhood, right? Because um, if there's always something to do and there's always something to heal and there's always some work to be done, it. and I wonder, I wonder if I'm making assumptions here, I might be, but I wonder if the resistance to do inner child work comes from a place of like wanting to protect your parents, right? Like saying my parents were really good parents. And if I go and indulge myself in this inner child work in some way, shape or form, it's like I'm throwing them under the bus, right? So I'm just going to say everything was good. What's your, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's more than an assumption. I think that's, that's really true, at least in the clients that I've seen. And in my own personal experience, I feel like the biggest resistance to doing trauma healing and inner child work is, is that. And once again, it's kind of that denial piece of like protecting yourself also. It's not about just protecting your parents. It's about protecting yourself from the truth of the different ways that your parents have wounded you. Mm -hmm. And I think it also comes from that place of like, well, if they wounded me, then I have to hate them or they're bad people instead of knowing like, yeah, they're human. Like they're not my parents. I can look at them as humans who have wounding themselves and therefore have wounded me in certain ways. And it doesn't make them wrong or me wrong to do this work. It makes me human. Like we all have work to do right now in this world, healing generational trauma no one's exempt from it. So I think hopefully that normalizes it as well. Like no matter how good the situation was or how bad it was, like it's coming from their own wounding and you don't have to blame them in order to heal. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and something super important, super, super important. If you're taking notes and you've got a highlighter, I want you to highlight this. Your parents are human. My parents are human. Amanda's parents, we're human beings. We're fucked up. We all are, right? Like we're all, but we all are doing the best that we can with what we were given. So whichever side of that spectrum that you're on, it's okay, you know? And, and I think it's important too, Amanda, to say, we don't have to hate our parents or we don't have to hate our teachers or that bully in school or whoever's pain that we're still carrying around inside of us because we're all just trying to, we're all just trying to learn our lessons and, and make it through, make it through this life in one piece. Mm -hmm. Yep. I completely agree with that. And I think taking that pressure off of yourself that like 
doing the work means that you have to feel a certain way about your parents or you need to like set certain boundaries in the beginning, like just taking that pressure off of yourself about what it'll mean and giving yourself the space and the curiosity to explore what's there before you even have to do anything, like just taking that pressure off. Mm -hmm. I want to ask specifically about the modalities that you use. I know you mentioned that you do breath work to help, uh, to help kind of process, I'm assuming process some of this grief and clear some of it and get that energy out of, um, out of the body. So my clients all know, have done breath work with me, but for somebody again, who's never heard of breath work and is like, what are you talking about? Can you explain to me what is breath work? Like I'm a third grader. <laughs> I love that you, yes, this is such a good way to explain everything. Um, so for breath work, it's to me, it's really just bypassing the mind and getting into the body. If we're just going to be super simple about it, it's turning off that part of us that usually comes from childhood that wants to control and wants to absolutely know what's going to come next. And that can mean controlling our feelings, you know, controlling memories that we might have. And breath work just allows those barriers more like pushes those barriers <laughs> to come down. And I find that, you know, within the first few minutes of breath work and it can be any pattern, there's, you know, certain ones I use in my practice that really open up the emotional body. You start to notice your mind is like going crazy. It's trying to protect you. It's trying to not allow you to go there. And when you bypass that control in the body and you're like, no, I'm fucking going there. Like I'm going to feel whatever's here. It's something that we normally can't access in our day-to-day -day life, especially if we have a lot of trauma. Um, it's really hard to be in our bodies. It's hard for our nervous systems to process this stuff. So that's what breath work has given me and my clients. Mm -hmm. <sighs> so good, Amanda. You're such, the work that you do is so important and so needed um, I want to ask you, what are, what is people's kind of resistance to going down this path and taking a look? You'd mentioned they want to protect themselves and their mind like is going crazy and not wanting to go there. And what do you find is, is people's biggest kind of resistance to, to diving in and, and starting to peel that, that away? You know, I want to speak to women specifically right now, because I know you work specifically with women and a really big thing that we're healing generationally right now as women is, you know, the grief and the pain that we hold in our hearts and also in our womb, not to get too woo woo and mystical here with you, but you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go there and just, you, I find for myself and for the women that I work with, like we hold so much armor and, and so much pain in our hearts and you don't have to go very far back in your family line on your maternal line to see how much we have been shut down as women, whether that's our expression or the pain that we've held, it's all in our heart and our wombs. And so something that my coach has taught me that really helped me is that when you're feeling there, of course, there's a resistance to deeply feeling because you're not just feeling for yourself. Like you are also feeling for your mom and your grandma and your great grandma and, you know, you're sovereign. You can choose when to turn that on or when to turn that off if you want. But I think a lot of women naturally feel resistance because they're not just healing themselves. And that's why I love this work because it's about so much more than just you. It's about liberating your family line and that's heavy work. Not everyone is meant to do that. Not everyone is really meant to go there. And so that's why I say I love the deep part of it. And that's why I do this work because I work with women who do want to go there, who do want to find freedom and liberate their family line and step into the power that they're meant to hold in this life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so beautiful. First of all, so beautiful, so powerful, so incredible. Uh, everyone who listens to this podcast has heard me get up on my feminist soapbox at least a hundred times. So I want to explore that. I want to pull on that a little bit more with you when you say that as women, we hold this pain in our hearts and we hold this pain in our wombs. Can you please elaborate on that for us? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely can. And I think I can speak to like personal experience here and that'll probably be the easiest way to explain it. So coming off of like my family line and just looking back at the trauma that my mom and my grandma have experienced specifically with like, you know, keeping respect for them, like, you know, there there's sexual trauma that happens to a lot of women in this world. I would say most women, and that can mean, you know, assault. And I also believe that like not knowing and not learning about our periods is also one of the scariest things. Like the fact that we grow up and are not taught how magical our periods are. We aren't taught how to respect our bodies, like all of those more sexual things. And these feelings about your sexuality are stored in your womb. So let's say your mom experienced some sort of sexual trauma. You're holding that within your womb. So that's kind of crazy that when you go in to do that healing, like you're doing it for them and you can kind of see how that translates and coming from the more personal experience part, I would say that, you know, in my family, my mom really struggled with mental illness. And I watched that growing up like alcoholism, mental illness, and her working through that, but her still getting to a point where she can't fully process that on her own. She didn't heal her inner child enough to have those skills. So it's getting passed down to me in the family line. And I hold the grief that she has never felt in my heart. I hold the pain that she experienced in childhood in my heart. And so when I go to access these two feminine poles that we have, our heart and our womb, you can see like there's so much there for me to unravel. And to me, it's a privilege. And that's taken a lot of rewiring, a lot of mindset work. And some days it does feel like a burden and it does feel heavy because it is, but I also truly believe it's a privilege to be the person doing this work right now for my family. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a, it's a really important and powerful place to work from to say, I can honor this really intense, really heavy grief, pain, traumatic part of myself at the same time as I can live a joyful life and do meaningful work and participate in things that make me feel amazing and make me feel the opposite of that trauma. Right. Right. And, and you know, I, I, I understand, like you said, this work isn't necessarily for everybody, right? It can get pretty intense. And I understand why a lot of people wouldn't want to go there, right? Like once you start, you kind of get addicted. It's like, a, you get addicted to the, get addicted. To the, you get addicted to the deep. But I think that, you know, for anyone who's listening that you're kind of like, I never want to do anything like this. Like, this sounds way too scary. This is not approachable whatsoever. I think that it's really, 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 really important to remember that it's not all heavy like that, right? Like that heaviness, that heaviness has to exist so that the joy feels so good. And so that the love feels so good because without that contrast, you're just always kind of rocking around in the middle, right? Like you're never really super sad and you're never really super happy and you're just always kind of numb which is fine. If that's the way that you choose to live your life, like that's fine. That's your life. Right. But when you want to go super deep like that, that just makes the highs so much higher in my opinion, in my interpretation, the way that I see it. When people start working with you, do you just dive them right in? Or do you push them off the deep end right away them? Or are you kind of like a dip your toes in, uh, this is, we're going to go in kind of gently. What's your process to get people warmed up for this? Wow. Yeah. This just made, it made me realize, I don't think I've ever been asked this question and I am like one of my gifts. I would say that I've really owned in these past few months, few months is that I'm very activating. And so I would say I attract women who are ready to go deep first call. Like I hear from my women, I tell them on our calls before we start working together, like this is not for the faint of heart. And you could go a different route. Like you could go to therapy. There's, you could go to a support group. There's so many places you can go. You don't have to be here, but I work with women who are ready to. So I would say it happens pretty quickly. And I always hear after the first few weeks, like, wow, I, like I knew you were serious, but I didn't know you were this serious. 
Um, and I take pride in that because I love, I love pushing people and it does all end up amazing for them. It's the transformation that they need. And I totally agree with what you said. Like the degree to which you feel your darkness is the degree to which you're able to change your life and feel joy and really going into like that death cycle of I'm going to feel all of this allows you to rebirth in a way that you've probably never been able to do because you've never allowed yourself to feel the shit that's not allowing you to rebirth. Mm, wow. So good. I have goosebumps from that. Whew, so good. So Amanda, even though I could talk to you about this forever, um, I think that, you know, there are definitely women who are listening right now who might be feeling a tug to kind of take a peek, maybe get a little bit curious if the only way they can dip their toes in with you is by stalking you on social media. (laughs) Then my question would be for anyone who's, you know, feeling called to do some inner child healing or um, this beautiful work that you do. How, in what capacity do you work with women? What does that look like for you? How do you offer uh, the privilege of occupying this healing space with you? Thanks for asking that. There's a few different levels of working with me and I've, you know, I really love offering one-on-one. I always have that available Um, group coaching. And then recently I've kind of brought on some just one hour sessions with me so that if you aren't ready to dive into a full container, you can just do like a one hour breath work session with me. So especially if the breath work spoke to you, that's a really great way to kind of dip your more, dip your toes in than fully go swimming. But um, right now I am enrolling for my one-on-one program. And that just looks like a four month container where we meet weekly. And that's probably the deepest that you can possibly go with me. So you can find all that information through my Instagram. If you go to stock and, and go to my bio. Okay. And if we want to stalk you, if listeners want to stalk you, where is the best place to find you, Amanda? Yes. So my Instagram right now is wild way healing and my website's currently under construction. So that's all the stocking you'll be able to do, but you can find out almost anything through my Instagram. Awesome. And for the gals who are in the stepmom story, Amanda is going to be hosting an inner child healing workshop for us on the inside. And she's going to be doing a little breath work, beautiful release for us as well on the inside. So Stepmom story gals get excited about that because we have not seen enough or we haven't seen the end of Amanda yet. Uh, for everybody else, feel free to join the stepmom story, obviously, or check Amanda out on Instagram at Wild Way Healing. Amanda, thank you so much for your time, for your energy, for the work that you are doing, for the way that you are showing up and healing women in the world. It is an absolute honor to have stumbled across your hashtag in my inner child healing journey. <laughs> so good. Uh, so good. Thank you so much for being here. Do you have any last words for our, for our listeners? You know, I just want to say really quickly that if you are feeling the call to get in touch with your inner child, like after listening to this podcast to open up your journal and just try writing to them and start connecting with them. It can be so much simpler than we make it to be. So I just wanted to give them that little tip that you can connect at any point. And that's all. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I love that. And uh, saying any point, I'm just going to, we're never going to get off this call. Are we, we're never going to get off this podcast saying any point. (laughs) Do you, do you mean by that? When you say, open your journal, write to your inner child. The first thing that came in my mind was, well, how old am I supposed to be when I write to this child? Is that what you mean by it can be at any point? Do you just like pick a number or how, who, how old should we write to ourselves? See, I think this is where people get stuck because we make it complicated. We're like, how old do I have to be? Like, how do I connect? How does it all happen? Um, so I so would, I would, want, <laughs> I would say like, it's just a good way to connect to the essence. Like you're connecting to the essence of your inner child. It can be really any age and just starting to say, you know, Hey, just, just really having a dialogue with them and seeing like what they want to say, just like how we communicate with our intuition or our higher self, you can commune with your inner child. And I promise you, if you give them the opportunity to speak to you through journaling and through writing, they will. Okay. Beautiful. 
so you can be as old as you want to be. You're just yeah. at the essence of the inner child. I love it. You're at the essence. <laughs> Don't overthink it. Stop thinking then. Okay. <laughs> Well, Amanda, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm so excited to have you inside of the group to do your beautiful little healing with us. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm, Can't wait. Thanks, Brittany. I hope this episode got your wheels turning and showed you just how powerful you are. I would invite you to take 30 seconds and tap subscribe to this podcast. When you subscribe to the podcast, then rest assured you will never miss an episode. And in no time, spinning your wheels will be a thing of the past. Thank you for listening and subscribing. And if you enjoyed this episode, it would mean the absolute world to me if after you subscribed, you jumped on over and left me a five-star review and better yet, a written review. I am on a mission to let every mom and stepmom know that you can create the life of your dreams. And I need your help to change the world. The world needs us. Thank you so much for subscribing and leaving me a five-star review. I will see you next week. For more behind-the-scenes action and to get really up close and personal with me and our beautiful step family, jump on over to Instagram and follow me at the step queen. Don't be shy. Send me a DM. Tag me in your posts, tag me in your stories. Let me know what you're up to and what about the podcast has been blowing your mind. I cannot wait to get to know you better and Instagram is my jam. I love you so much. I love you so much. Make it rain, girlfriend. (laughs) Late night podcasting. (laughs) Who am I? Where Where are we? (laughs) Where are we? What dimension are we in? You should keep that part, please. (laughs) We're in the upside down. We're in the upside fucking down right now. I think so.